Hello, baseball fans. Jaime Becerril here, along with Corey Satman, Ruben Amario Jr., and Ricky Botalico. In another year of spring training Q&A presented by Toyota, proud sponsors of Philadelphia Phillies. I know last season was one of the most anticipated seasons. Now, I believe this year the difference is that this is the moment for those players to shine, to have a great season, and the team knows that. The team, what, what they're doing is they're polishing the same players that they like. Now, the fans, the fans, that's a different story. They show their support. They show that loyalty to the Red Battalion, and it is a party here, and it is contagious. Yeah, it definitely is a party. Every time you come down here, it never disappoints. I mean, I saw, what, six, seven uh, standing room only deep out here all game long. I mean, that's, that's insane for spring training. And, uh, yeah, the crowd's always behind this team, and I think this team's going to give them a lot a lot to cheer about this year. Yeah, I, every time I step out uh, off that plane and cruise on down the causeway to here to Clearwater, uh, almost, what is it, 70 years now um, of baseball here in Clearwater with the Phillies, it is special. I, there's a real feeling of uh, joy and uh, happiness and, you know, brings back a lot of great memories as a player uh -huh. and uh, playing with Ricky and, and so many others. But uh, the support that they've gained and, and the sort of the uh, the connection that this team has had with the fans, I mean, it translates and you see it here with, uh, with, with the support you see here every day. Yeah, there were nearly 11,000 people here today, the eighth largest crowd in this ballpark's history. Uh, we've seen several sellouts here early in camp. It just speaks to the fan interest that we've seen at Citizens Bank Park in the last few seasons. And, you know, everybody's ready here to watch the Phillies try to finish the job that they've gotten so close two years in a row. Yeah, 10,934 people here today, almost sold out. And it's been constant. Every day, every day has been the same. And, you know, the, these fans, they, they want to see that, what you're mentioning. They want to see that we were seven seven games combined, five uh, the, the last season, two the season before that. And that's one of the biggest questions. Uh, is this team ready? Is this team actually good enough to have that to bring that to the city we want that yeah i mean you look at the landscape of the national league this still looks like one of the best teams other than the dodgers and the braves there's really nobody on paper that's in the phillies class they brought back all of their key guys you have all of these superstars right in the middle of their prime this just feels like the time and then dave dombrowski in the front office went out this offseason and added a lot of necessary depth so the phillies that you're seeing uh, on the field in grapefruit league play this is a deeper roster than they've had really throughout this entire era and i, I always actually thought that this team Last year, when they were down to the final four, I really believe that as far as the length and breadth of the team, it was the best uh, ball club in, in, in all of baseball. Now, they couldn't get past the Arizona Diamondbacks, and I know Texas got hot, but I do believe in my heart of hearts that uh, as far as you know, pitching, defense, offense, the whole package, I did believe that the, that the Phillies had the best ball club in, in, in the final four. I, I, th I just think it was a disappointment last year. I mean, when it really came down to it, you went to Arizona thinking, all right, this series is over before they even come back to Citizens Bank Park. But then you almost had that wild card in your pocket. All right, they didn't play very well when they went out to Arizona. You still have two games com coming at home at Citizens Bank Park. And they just it, it's very simple. It, it just didn't happen. I mean, things kind of went south on them out, out in Arizona a little bit. They couldn't really they, – they couldn't regroup. And when you don't regroup in a situation like that, your season ends. I mean, I, I agree with yeah. Ruben. I think – they were the best team left. There's no doubt in my mind. And there's things that you have to uh, obviously fix. Like uh, one of the things that I've seen that they're actually emphasizing is defense. Trey Turner, he has to catch better. He knows that. He said that last year. And, he, and the team knows that. And they're working on it. That's what we're seeing in Clearwater. They're emphasizing in the defense. Yeah, Trey Turner's talked about that several times. That you know, He said two weeks ago, I know I'm not the best defensive shortstop in baseball, but I also know I'm not the worst defensive shortstop in baseball. And last year, his errors were toward the top of the league. But one of the other points of emphasis in camp has been lack of chasing. The Phillies, that was their fatal flaw last year in the playoffs against the Diamondbacks, against that Arizona bullpen. They were just expanding the strike zones. A lot of the key right-handed hitters in particular expanding the strike zone. 
That's been a focus all throughout camp, getting guys to just hone in on their zones, laying off that borderline pitch. This is the time of year to do it. Lay off that borderline pitch. See if it's able to be called a ball to give yourself more confidence to take that in the regular season. So that the points of emphasis the Phillies have had early in camp uh, are a couple of the things that they need to improve upon and reasons that last year ended the way it did. And one of the things that the fans should be really excited about uh, in my mind, is that you usually come into camp with like these glaring holes in your in, 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 on your club. This team really doesn't have glaring holes uh, at, holes, and I think it's a uh, uh, it, it's a great credit to Dave Dombrowski and, and and John Middleton of sort of shoring up those holes. There's always going to be problems, and and at some point there's going to be injuries you have to deal with, and and what have you, and guys just not performing. But they're coming into this camp. Uh, really, if they stay healthy through the camp, they've got a chance to do some real damage. And there's not, you know, you're not looking at like a giant hole in this in this lineup or in the rotation or bullpen that uh, that just you point to and you say, hey, they got to do this, this or this. If that thing comes up, I think that they will certainly address it at some point during the season. But uh, right now. They're in pretty good shape. When was the last time, and, and it, this is just being honest, you, you were a general manager. When was the last time that you saw a team go into spring training there's really not a spot open? I mean, the only thing they're really looking for is any kind of depth. There are no spots to be found on this team right now. Final spot on the bench, but last with, couple bullpen spots. One spot spots. on the bench, but there's a guy there who has it right now. Right. I mean, so, yes, it may be there for the taking. But, uh, I mean, I, I can't remember a team that has gone into spring training like this. Yeah, it's been a while. I mean, probably in the Yankees 2009, maybe? 10, and 11 when we were in, yeah. in that era where we didn't have a whole lot of holes. Definitely um, a lot of but, holes. But, but, uh, but that didn't – that didn't that uh, we haven't been in this situation in a long time. You're right, Ricky. I just, I just hope it benefits the team. Sometimes you bring in new blood that helps the team. This one was – they went completely opposite and figured, all right, let's re-sign Aaron Nola. That will be our big signing. You added Mar uh, Maryfield later on it, for maybe just a little bit of a push. But I, I look at this, and, man, if these guys really like each other like they say they do, this could be a fun year. And they, it seemed that they know each other a lot. You see, you come here to Clearwater, and it, they seem like a family. They know each other. They, This is the moment. Like I said, this is a moment for them to actually have, you know, and shine. And the best thing that we have here in Clearwater, too, is the fence. And that's why we have Ashley, and she has the first question. So let's go with Ashley. She has the first question with the fans. Yeah, guys, our first fan question comes from Steve. And he wants to ask, Corey, what do you think the opening day lineup will be? Oh, oh. Well, oh, right we know. Out shoot. <laughs> go get him. <laughs> we know that Rob Thompson likes to alternate the lefties and righties as much as possible. I would fully expect Kyle Schwarber to be in the leadoff spot, barring something crazy that happens the rest of camp. So you're probably looking at – Schwarber, Turner, Harper, the four spots of question. Alec Bohm was in that cleanup spot last year in the playoffs, and uh, there were questions, was he protecting Bryce Harper enough? So could be Real Muto, could be Castellanos in that four spot, Stott five, uh, I guess Castellanos or Real Muto six, Marsh seven, and, you know, filling out the lineup from there. But I think it's going to be pretty much similar to what we saw last year. The big question is, will Johan Rojas be the everyday center fielder? Uh, he'd be batting ninth. If not, you might see Whit Merrifield in the opening day lineup, for example. And Rojas is actually a good question because he, I mean, I, I spoke with him today, actually, and he said that he seems bigger. He is actually, his talent, as we know, is to anticipate the balls. I mean, it seems that naturally he knows where to go before the ball yeah. hits there. So he said, and I quote him, he said, they better, the, 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 the opposite team better hit that ball out of the park because if it comes my way, they're going to be out. That's what he said. This He's got a lot of confidence in his ability to play that that position. And I, I've seen a lot of very good outfielders. Andrew Jones comes to mind as one of the best I've ever seen. And uh, and Johan's got that kind of an in instinct. He really is very good. Great nose to the ball. Jackie Bradley, who I worked with in Boston, also outstanding. Um, and I see those a lot of those similarities that uh, Johan has that 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 it factor in the in the outfield. Um, hopefully, he can hit enough to for to to be a guy that uh, they can count on for this season. Yeah, I played with a guy, Mike Cameron. You remember mm -hmm. Mike oh, Cameron? Of what course. great yeah. jumps he got up, he got off of the bat. And and I think that's exactly what Rojas does. I mean, when you're in center field, it's all about instincts. It's all about making that first move and taking that first step. And I think. He reminds me of, like, old-school great center fielders that are going to go and get anything from gap to gap. And he has no fear about going gap to gap, although I don't think he really had that issue last year because you have Castellanos and Wright, 
who's not covering a lot of ground. And it was Schwarber last year and left who wasn't covering enough ground. So he was free to roam all over all over the field. I, I, I just like his instincts. And I think when you have in, instincts out in the outfield, there's nothing like that. Ruben never got us any guys out in center field that would go and get the ball. Nah, I wasn't very now, good. What, what would you guys think? Uh, either, you know, you keep it's – it's a young player, so either you keep him uh, as a starter or either you send him back to the minors and keep him playing because you can't have the luxury of having a player like that and have him in the bench. Right, and he's going to dictate that. Johan Rojas, with his bat, will dictate whether he makes the opening day roster as a starting center fielder or does go down to AAA for more seasoning. One of the big priorities for Rojas in camp is bunting. Uh, he's been bunting a ton every day. And it's still not perfect. You know, there was a bunt single he had the other day that was kind of right back to the mound. He had six sacrifices last season. And it was almost like um, some of them were fluky. Most of them were back to the mound. You wanted to angle it better first baseline, third baseline. And it's just a matter of getting the repetition. If he can put that tool in his toolbox, that makes him a lot more valuable to the Phillies as, you know, a guy who can advance a runner with one out. And a, run, and a man on first base because, you know, Johan Rojas, he doesn't need to hit 300. He doesn't even need to hit 280. He just needs to hold his own at the plate. Totally agree with that. The other thing I'll say about Ricky when uh, that, that Ricky touched on was his, his outfield plays. He's not only an instinctive outfielder, but he also does things really well fundamentally. We talked about it on the broadcast today. I am so impressed by the way he actually works his body. He always works behind the ball. Um, he knows where to throw the baseball. He keeps his throws down consistently. He doesn't get too crazy with his throws. The fundamental piece, and that's that that combination for him to be able to have that kind of instinct and that kind of fundamental play, that's really, really rare in a very young player, and it's something that uh, the Philly fans should, should, should be looking forward to. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we have another question. Let's go with Ashley. Yeah, guys, I'm with Ian, and he has a question for Ricky. Um, Ricky, do you think that Spencer Thurnbull will crack the opening day roster as a long reliever, or do you think maybe it'll be a combination of Connor Brogdon, Junior Marte, and Dylan Covey? I like the way he's been throwing the ball. It, it, it wouldn't surprise me as a long, long guy out of the bullpen uh, with the ability to go in and make some starts. I mean, you hear about Dave Dombrowski talking about you need, what, 10 starters a year, he always says. He's going to be one of those guys. I, I think he makes a team out of the bullpen, in the bullpen. The Phillies used 100 players combined the last two seasons, so there's a lot of guys who are going to be able to help them. I actually talked to JT Real Muto yesterday about Spencer Turnbull, asked him what stuck out so far, and he said if you look at like the way that his stuff moved the one time that he's appeared in camp, four strikeouts, several of those pitches weren't even close to the strike zone, kind of speaks to the movement. The key with Turnbull is just keeping him in the zone enough. One of the other things that are really important for Rob Thompson and, and, and his ability to sort of maneuver his pitching staff is to make sure that he has guys – who can go multiple innings. Right now, in the minor leagues, no one's developing guys who can go multiple innings. And in fact, they're not developing guys who can go back-to-back. -back. So anytime you have a durable arm or somebody who can have multiple innings, that is really important for, for a guy like Rob Thompson who wants to be able to maneuver his bullpen as he wishes. And, you know, talking about pitching, Walker also bring, bringing Walker to the, to the equation – He was, a, he was a disappointment last last season. Uh, you know, he didn't even see any action in the in the uh, playoffs. And, you know, that was something that the fans get angry at, some of them, you know. And the, now we have to also see how he does, he, where if he has a spot in the rotation. Yeah, Taiwan Walker was a little bit behind schedule here in camp, made his first start of the spring today. And the velocity was a little bit down, but he said that's what he expected after an unusual buildup to camp. But, you know, I would say that it was up and down. It wasn't totally disappointing. He threw 172 innings, which has a lot of value in this day and age. We're, what were there, 15 guys league-wide who did that yep. last season? So, you know, led the team in wins. Um, he just wants to be more consistent this season. When things didn't go well for Taiwan Walker last year, a lot of it was pinned on the velocity. He was 90-91 yes, as opposed to 94-95. So that's a big key for him this season. Yeah, it's really about that, and I agree. I mean, uh, it wasn't the perfect uh, season for him, but he did get some wins. Um, I think that his overall consistency, he had a, like the pretty big splits between home and away, and he also had some splits between the righties and lefties. I think it's about being more consistent, uh, just a more consistent pitcher, and if he can do that and throw more more strikes, a lot of walks last year, that's what, yeah. um, and that's something that he's got to have to stay away from. You throw that many splits, you're going to throw a lot of bad pitches. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. You're a split-fingered uh, starting pitcher. I mean, most guys will pitch off the fastball. He has, he kind of pitches off of his split more. Yeah, than 33% splits. 33%. That's an awful lot. 
And usually that pitch, I mean, I don't know how you guys look at it. How many times do you actually fall in for a strike when you're actually when a pitcher's throwing it? I, I mean, if I was ever to use that pitch when I played, which I didn't throw it, I would throw it on a two-strike basis, and that's it, because I didn't want it to be a strike. I want the deception of it looking like a strike falling out of the zone. He uses it for strike pitches, and when you do that and you lose command of that, I mean, you, it you make can a little blow tougher. up innings quickly, and that's what he, he had a ton of – like he'd go two really good innings, and then all of a sudden the third inning, it's like you can't stop the merry-go-round. Yeah, those walks are what kill it. And we have another question. Let's go with Ashley again. Ashley. Hey, guys. I'm with Patty, and he has a question for Ruben. Who do you think the surprise Philly is going to be this year? Surprise Philly. Wow, that's a really good question. I think I don't think he's going to be a surprise, but I really think this is going to be like a monster breakout year for Bryson Stott. I'm a huge fan. I think Bryson's going to be a gold glove uh, second baseman. He was already, in my mind, a gold glove second baseman. I think he missed it by, like, what, four votes or something like that. But um, I know one of his goals is to want to hit 300. I love that thought process because nobody talks about how important batting average is, and it really is actually pretty important. Um, and, and he sort of has that thought process. I think he's growing as a player. I think he's maturing. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's necessarily a surprise, but I think he's going to be one of the best players in, the, in uh, on that club and, and on both sides of the ball. Is there anything you want to add? To I, I think Trey Turner. I think Trey Turner is going to be I, – I say a surprise. I can't really call him a surprise because – He's going to shock I, the world. I, well, I believe he's going to go back to where he was when he was playing for the Dodgers. I think his defense is going to come back around a little bit. Uh, but I think that's also going to play into this. You have to get off to a good start. I think the team's thinking like that. And I think if Trey Turner gets off to a good start, it will, it will build as the season goes on. So – I look for him to come out in, in the end of March and April on a tear. And I would just say Christopher Sanchez, you know, he turned a lot of heads in the second half last Great year. Uh, he had, you know, one of the lowest ERAs in baseball after the All-Star break. If you look at the opponent's batting average, it was the best changeup in all of baseball last season. He, in his first start of the spring, his fastball velocity was up three miles per hour, and he worked in a cutter. If he can do those both of those things while maintaining the command that he had last season, you know, He's, he can be much better than a number five starter. He could be a mid-rotation piece or even more uh, really promising signs early from Sanchez. Yeah, the other thing I, I'll yeah. say that, and a caveat that uh, JT Real Muto didn't really have the year that you, you would typically see from JT. I think he was pretty disappointed in that. I, I, I feel he's going to be one of those guys who's going to bounce back with a really excellent year this year, especially offensively. Yeah, and I don't think about I – don't, I don't know about saying a surprise, but I really want to see Castellanos uh, way better than what he did, did before. Uh, last year, right at the end of the season, we started know. very hot, but he had this, you know, slow yeah, finish. Really struggled definitely. With the finish. So I would like to see that, you know, just Castellanos come come hot. And talking about being uh, a player that will actually, uh, I spoke with uh, Bryson Stott yesterday, and he said we're going to be more selective as of what to hit and what not to, and that's something that I think they really need well, to. Castellanos is on the top of that list. Yeah, I totally. Mean, he's, He's the biggest free swinger I think I've ever seen in this sport. I mean, he's one of those guys that anything that looks like a strike and goes out of the zone, he's going to swing at. I don't know if he could change his stripes. Yeah, I think I, there are certain guys on this team that can. Yes. For instance, Trey Turner swinging at the pitch uh, above his shoulders or above, above his chest. I think he could change that. Uh, Casty, I don't know. Well, I, I think I – think, He's the old goat, and I don't know if he could change it. It's that low and away slider that Castiano struggles to lay off. But, I mean, Ruben mentioned JT Real Muto. In comparison, Real Muto, a lot of the pitches that he would chase on last year were just off the plate inside or just off the plate away. You look at his numbers in those two zones, he didn't have a lot of success. So it's just a matter of being able to lay off that pitch. He's already gone to work this winter and spring trying to do so. Uh, he swung it well early in camp as well, Real Muto. Yeah, and they're working on it. That That's the, the main part. They're working on that. They know that. So – uh, we have another question with Ashley. Ashley. Yep, we have a question for Corey coming from Paul. He wants to know, who would you rather have on the bench, Dahl or Cave? That's an interesting question. I mean, it comes a lot of those questions come down to, like, the roster flexibility, guys being out of options or not being out of options. David Dahl's in camp on a minor league deal. Uh, Jake Cave was with the Phillies for most of last season. Uh, you know, so far they both produced, I would say, relatively speaking, in camp. Um, Dahl, I would think, offers a little more upside. Former All-Star guy who hit 300 several times with the Rockies. And you look at his performance the last two years at AAA, he hit in the Dodgers organization, he hit in the Brewers organization, but he just wasn't able to find his way up to the majors. But that final spot on the bench or those final two spots on the bench, it's really one of the only like 
some of the only drama you're seeing in this camp. There are 25 other teams probably that are uh, envious of the Phillies for how many spots they have solidified at this point. Yeah, that's a that's a very important. Also, I, I think that uh, do you have to do you want to add anything to that, I guess? I just think uh, I have a feeling that the fact that Jake Cave has a little bit more versatility defensively may give him an edge. Um, and actually, you know, the, I think the real question is whether it's going to be Pache, Pache. Or, or Cave. I frankly would like rather have Pache for me just because I think his defense in case things do not work out with Johan Rojas and he cannot make the adjustments that are necessary, they're going to need somebody who can play defense, particularly in center field, who I think is a little, you know, a, a shade better than, than uh, Brandon Marsh out there. Obviously, Brandon we got to get him on the field, and he's getting really close to being on the field. But uh, but I think Pache is, you know, you don't sleep on his defense because he's a very good defensive player, and he's starting to he's starting to understand his swing a little bit better. Uh, that's why I feel, at least at this stage, and I know it's a lefty-righty thing, um, but it's it's going to be a tough decision for Dave Dombrowski and the rest of those, uh, you know, and Rob Thompson as to how they're going to how they're going to you know they. they how they're going to end up getting that 26 man on the on the field. But when you really look at it, how many times are you going to put in a left-handed hitter? You literally need it to be in the number eight or nine slot, and that is it. You're not going to pinch hit. You're not going to take Casty out. You're not going to take Turner out. You're not going to take Real Muto out. I, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if Jake Cave stays. Stays. I, I, I think. I think Ruben's right. I think it's more if Pache stays or not. And I, I think he's doing a nice job in spring training right now. He can get to a ball in the outfield. Um, he's showing some pop here and there. So, I, I mean, I'd be – Jake, Jake Cave's one-dimensional to me. And also – And I don't like to say that about anybody, but I feel like he's a, he's just a left-handed stick off the bench. And also remember, you know, when we're talking about who's going to fill these final spots on the roster, it's also possible that it might be somebody who's not even in the organization right now. Yeah. I mean, Christian Pache was acquired the day before opening day last year he wasn't on anybody's radar as a Phillies bench piece so a lot of different options a lot of balls in the air and there's you know half a camp still to go here yeah definitely remember guys you're watching spring training Q and a uh, sponsored by Toyota and let's go with Ashley for another question yeah guys our next question is for Ricky he says can the team survive with the closer by committee and who can step up and take that job I don't here's my here's my who could step up I think any of them could I mean Hoffman uh, was throwing the ball extremely well last year Alvarado I think he could close at any given point Sir Anthony okay he had, he's had his ups and downs he might be that one guy in in this uh, uh, bullpen rotation that has those opposite years you know has a bad year good year bad year good year um, and Orion Kirkering I mean who knows I think this is one of those few I have never ever believed in going into a regular season without a closer but that's how teams are now there's i mean you name a closer for every team i i, I would hand you a hundred dollars right now yeah there's probably like 10 real closers yeah, yeah, eight, or, eight or nine they just yeah. don't do it anymore and i mean like when i used to leave spring training i kind of wanted to know what i was doing leaving spring training because if you're a hitter didn't you want to know if you were going to play if you were going to be a bench player if you were you know i you just want to know. You want some kind of an idea of what you need to be prepared for. Yeah, I mean, it is it is an odd situation, but I do feel, and, and you, you mentioned the one name that I think is probably the one guy that's probably the most important guy in their bullpen is Sir Anthony Dominguez. If he bounces back and gets gains his confidence because he's got the he's got as good a stuff as anybody in in baseball as far as his repertoire is concerned. If he gains his confidence, is able to throw more consistent strikes, and just believes in his stuff, I think this bullpen's got a chance to be really, really good. Um, and, you know, you just never know when it's going to click for a guy. And uh, hopefully he has really strong early outings, and he can sort of let that sort of snowball. That's sort of what happened with Alvarado when he came back from being in the minor leagues. He started to throw the ball with a lot more confidence. Now you see the Jose Alvarado, who is probably one of the, if not the best left-handers in baseball, um, because he's so confident with his stuff now. I hope that same thing happens to Saranta. It would also make a big difference if the Phillies get the best version of Gregory Soto, who came over last year, and he's throwing 99, 100 miles per hour. He really only had a handful of blow-up outings, but those blow-up outings skewed his numbers for the entire season. So it's just a matter of him you know, being able to avoid the snowball effect. And He's a guy who made an all-star team in Detroit. He has great stuff, can get lefties and righties out. 
And with Jose Alvarado being such an important piece that the Phillies want to deploy at the biggest spot in the game, that increases the importance of Soto as like the second most important lefty. But in saying that, Matt Strom, also a very underrated, versatile piece, started for the Phillies, relieved for the Phillies last year, is one of those few multi-inning guys and give the Phillies like five or six outs. So, you know, he's another piece not to sleep on, Matt Strom. And talking about closing games, who will you choose, Jose Alvarado or uh, Sir Anthony? Alvarado would be my choice. I, I think when he's healthy, you know, a 12 pitch inning, it, that, that's what you look for for guys uh, in, in the bullpen. There were there were streaks last year and the year before where he went on month streaks where he was unhittable. I'll take that over anything else. Yeah. And Ashley has another question. Guys, I'm with Tony, and he just has something he wanted to say to y'all. Hey, guys, long-time viewer, first-time caller. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> it's great to see Ruben and Ricky. Tony I've B. Never met, I've never met the great Corey Sodman, but uh, you guys are doing a great job. If anybody hasn't been down to Clearwater for spring training, you got to come down. It's a great experience. You guys do a terrific job. Love you. Keep it going, guys. That's, That's a Hall of Famer. Just Tony, yeah. Yeah. Tony Budo, the man. There you go, the fan of the year. There you go. <laughs> he's, at, he's absolutely right. Come on, every time you come down to Clearwater, you get that feeling about you. Well, I'm most of the time because we're coming down for baseball, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like Ruben said, you walk off of that plane and you know you're in you you're in a place you want to be. So, and I want to talk about that a little bit, Ricky. You know, people that come here, they show that uh, support, they show that loyalty, and it is different. Uh, you know, baseball here, you actually chill. You just, You, you know, it's 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 just really enjoyable. You go back to the Citizens Ballpark, and that's a whole different game. <laughs> yeah. You know, we get very creative, we get very intense, and that's actually great because you know what? We're celebrating 20 years of history at the Citizens Citizen Ballpark. Bank, right? Can you believe it's 20 Unbelievable. years? Unbelievable! It's crazy. I remember opening the ballpark. I remember them sending me from here, from Clearwater, to go back before we open the season. And sort of check things out before we actually open the season, and I uh, and I can rem remember it like it was yesterday, and now it's 20 years later. We're uh, we're celebrating that ballpark. Still looks brand new. It still yeah, is it one of the most beautiful parks new. in baseball. Yeah, it's fantastic. And that's something I want to to I, I want to add, actually ask you, what is the best memories that you guys can share with us from the Citizens Ballpark? Whew. You want to go first, Rick? There's a lot uh, of them, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I could have brought up myself, but I won't. <laughs> Just go. Ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll go. I'll go with Brad Lidge finishing out the uh, 2008 World Series. Woo! Those Those are, top, I that. mean, I guess uh, everybody not him going down on his knees, hands up, chooch coming in. Lidge blows out his knee. How could you not forget? <laughs> yeah, that, that was not great. That the, the, that part of it wasn't great, but it was pretty fun. How about you, Ruben? Um. You know, when we made the trade for Roy Halladay, one of the things that was really important for him um, was to play in the playoffs. He had never pitched a game in the playoffs uh, when he was with Toronto. And for him to take the baseball in the very first game after a very long career and pitch for the first time in a playoff game against Cincinnati Reds and throw a no-hitter, was one of the most extraordinary moments I've ever seen. And in my, my eyes. And, and made me cry, and it still does. Makes me emotional. In, in my it's, eyes. It was just amazing. I was doing pre-post that year. I saw the, the perfect game, and that game against the Reds, he threw the ball better that game than he did in that perfect game. It was just amazing. And how about there being game-ending plays that were not simple? You know, you think about the Juan Castro play yeah. on the third base in the Marlins game and Carlos Ruiz's play right in front of the plate. Yeah. Juan, Juan Castro made it look easy. Yeah, he sure did. I would yeah, say, you know, I, I just think back to that Jimmy Rollins walk-off double off Jonathan Broxton in the 2004 <laughs> NLCS, a legendary call from Scott Fransky, really one of, like, the most iconic uh, walk-off playoff calls I can remember. But – That that was just a it was a huge moment. I mean, if they lose that game, it's two two in that series. Maybe the entire uh, series turns out differently. But Jimmy just had a, a flair for the dramatic all throughout that era, a knack for clutch hitting, and that was probably his uh, you know his biggest single single. He's gonna uh, win the game. Late appearance. Yeah, it was, that's the one I still I remember those memes the next day. I was in I the studio for that one. Oh, nice. I want to say mine probably will be when Bryce Harper gave us that hope, game five. And oh. That was the hope that we all needed in this city, and that just felt amazing. And you know that I think is one of mine. I, I don't know if you guys. Yeah, saw. I don't, I don't that think might be Bryce the biggest home run though. I think ever. I think it's the biggest home run I think I've ever seen. 
I don't think Bryce is done. I think there's. Oh a no, he's not. No, no, he's, but he's that open. No, I'm just saying he's he, got he, more in him. He yeah. did open the door for the Phillies, and I think he's got another big one in him that, that that's another be more, more memorable. <laughs> Definitely, and you know that actually, I think gives us the hope that because just it was it was a, a while before you know the Phillies went back to the World Series, and that I guess that was what opened the door, like you were saying. Well, yeah. I mean, you also look at some of the playoff resumes that these guys have put together. Like Bryce Harper has been so much better in the postseason as a Philly than I think anybody would have ever expected. Every time he comes up in a big spot, he's been able to come through. Zach Wheeler with uh, the lowest whip in playoff history. Ranger Suarez with one of the lowest ERAs in playoff Don't history. Don't forget the Schwarberian. Yeah, he, he <laughs> bombs two years in a row. All right. And, guys, we have a very important guest. Uh, let's go with the president of the Tri-State uh, Toyota dealership, Ashley. Yeah, guys, I'm here with Paul Muller, and we're just going to talk a little bit about Toyota's relationship with the Phillies. So can you tell us a little bit about that relationship, Paul? Sure. We've been uh, sponsors of the Phillies for about 30 years, uh, and we do things with them literally all year long, especially during the baseball season. Uh, we do all our, our veterans things with the Phillies, uh, fans feeding fans, uh, they get involved with us with our um, with our philanthropic efforts all throughout the year. Uh, they are an absolutely magnificent organization, and what I think makes it work so well for us, Ashlyn, is their values and their their core values are pretty much the same as ours. I mean, we both do pretty well, so you want to try to take care of people, uh, and and uh, be, it's the community, it's the people that that take care of you. We want to make sure we take care of them. Awesome, I love it. What's in store for the upcoming season? Pretty much a lot of the same stuff. We do all the veteran stuff, all the uh, the the food things that we do with the Phillies, uh, sponsoring a lot of their events. Uh, one of the things that's kind of cool is this year we're, we're the sponsors of Cole Hamill's retirement, which is kind of cool. He's coming back to uh, to retire as a Philly. Um, we also sponsor the the Wall of Fame, the Phillies uh, Wall of Fame, which we do every year, and we have coaches clinics for uh, for PAL and for uh, for athletes with disabilities. Um, and again, it's just we, we want to give back, uh, and the Phillies are just so wonderful about helping us do that. It's just an honor to be a part of their organization. I love it, Paul. So what do you enjoy most about being a baseball fan and a Phillies fan? Oh, listening to Ruben and Ricky. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the camaraderie. It really is. I mean, we're laughing out here, but all these people are out here listening to them talk about baseball. And, you know, people use the term baseball geek. And I, I mean, you guys, when I listen to you talk about the balls low and away and they can't do this, and they, I mean, I'm fascinated because I'm, I'm not smart enough to to figure any of that out. I realize, Neither was Ruben. <laughs> that was cool. I realize it's what you do for a living, but you really do it so well. But I really think it's just, they said today this was the fourth largest crowd that they've had at, uh, they can't, that's unbelievable. It's a spring training, I mean, it's a gorgeous day, but like four deep in standing room only. Um, I wish I could get this at some of my dealerships. Well, thank you so much, Paul. We're so happy that you're here, and thank you for joining our live Q and A. Thank you. Appreciate it. I will. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Paul. And uh, now we well, let's go with the season predictions. Uh, go ahead, Ricky. Uh, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a limb, and I'm gonna say Phillies. They're gonna win the NL East. I think they win it. I'm going to say that they win 100 games on the nose wow. and they win the East. Wow, really? I'm feeling it this year. I'm sick of the Braves. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've hated them for, as you know, Ruben, I had to go through oh, those yeah, years yeah, yeah. playing against them with Glavin, Maddox, Smoltz. You know, the hell, the, the hell with the Braves. Go, Phil. <laughs> Any Brave fan there? Around there? Not too many. Ruben, predictions. So I do think that they're going to have to knock off Atlanta, and I think they can. Um I do believe I, – I think that they're going to finish the division in a tie and we're going to win the tiebreaker. I think they're going to be 95 and 95, both those teams, and we're going to win the tiebreaker because we'll have won the head-to-head -head competition against them. So I got the uh, Phillies winning the NL East as well. So we're not 100 games. Yes, I'm telling you. Wow. Think about this. Every up. time Rob Thompson gets them going after the first two months of the season, they play uh, 600 baseball. So the question so is started can, from day one. Yeah, the question is, can they do that from March 28th? Because that is two years in a row. They're right around June 1st. They played like the equivalent of a 95 yes. to 100 win team. That's right. It's hard to follow the boldness of the uh, divisional tie or the Phillies winning <laughs> the, the divisional NLEs. tie. But, like I, you know, I do just think that this is 
the same way that 2011 was the best ver regular season version of that team that won 102 games, I think this is going to be the best regular season version of this team. And I do think it's going to be an upper 90s win total based on the you know, the uh, incumbents they bring back. And just as I said earlier, you look at the rest of the National League, other than the Dodgers, other than the Braves, how many other rosters scare you? There really aren't many. There are two teams in this division in the Marlins and Nationals that are could lose 90-plus games as well. So There are, there are a, rosters that you don't even know any names. The Oakland there, are, there are some of those. Try, try the Oakland A's. Try, no, try maybe later. Five guys on their roster. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, guys, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you for watching. This was Spring... Awesome. Look at all the fans. There you go. All pumped out. Thank you for watching. Guys.